Welcome back to another segment of Behind the Scenes of the Waltons. Today, I continue my conversation with Martha Nix. If you're enjoying these, please do hit like and subscribe. Now, interesting uh, question for you, um, because many times the fans have mentioned how many people did crossover roles between the Waltons and Little House on the Prairie. Of course, I never had a chance to work on the show for obvious reasons, but um, you did. You did a couple of episodes. And how did you find, um, like, behind the scenes, those two sets? Again, remember, I'm logging in as a child. Mm -hmm. you know, I was, I think maybe I did both my Little House episodes after the Waltons. My second one, I was 15. So my first one, I was maybe 13. Um, the second episode I did, Michael um, directed, um, not Michael Learned. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Landon, right? <laughs> yes. um, I just felt so cared for. And he was such an encourager, such a great communicator. Um, you hear people say they were an actor's director. I mean, he was, mm -hmm. but he was just so genuinely kind. Mm -hmm. And um, I loved working for him. Um, and it, it was fun to be on set there. I mean, back lot there was going to Simi Valley right near Magic Mountain. And it was, you know, dirt and all that. The school, um, there were a lot more kids in school. Um, even when we had extras for the school scene, it was a larger group of kids. Um, the person who stood out the most to me was Allison Arngren. I didn't have a lot of scenes with her. But she would just go out of her way to make sure that the guest actors were um, talked to and cared for. And she was just so genuinely kind, mm -hmm. um, exact opposite of her character. Um, and, and she pokes fun of that now. Um, but it, it was just diff it was different. I mean, I enjoyed doing Little House. Um, my scenes predominantly were with the character Albert. Um, and he's a really quiet guy mm -hmm. in person. I mean, you really have to draw it out of him, but he is, um, he's just quiet. He's unassuming. And, um, and I'm not quiet. <laughs> assuming. Um, and I played his girlfriend in both episodes, which is not comfortable when you're like 13 and 15 years old to play those roles. Um, so there was just an, an not intentional awkwardness, but that's just how it is when you're playing someone's girlfriend for seven days. And the actor who I left Albert for uh, <laughs> on the second episode, yes, I had two boyfriends in one episode, um, but he was on Days of Our Lives with me. And then he was on, he was my first kiss on Aloha Paradise, which was um a series that only lasted, I think, five episodes with Debbie Reynolds. Um, it was like kind of supposed to be the um, Fantasy Island. It was kind of that Fantasy Island where they'd have revolving actors on it. But Debbie Reynolds was um, the lead character on it. But I was Sharon Holstetter. Don't know why I remember that name. But my boyfriend, whom I had to kiss, first stage kiss, was on that show also. So... He was on Days, Little House, and then on Aloha Paradise with me. And um, so we already knew each each other. His name was Stephen Man Manley. Um, and so that was like kind of a homecoming thing of, you know, we had reconnected from our childhood. Um, but again, it's you're, you're fitting in to a new cast that's been established for years. And they were already in, in those shifts of, um, Laura was now teaching. It, she was no longer the kid on the show. And they had to brought in the second Nellie, per se. And um, so it's just all these moving parts. Um, but the main standout while I was on Little House was Michael Landon, hands down. And it was funny because as I was shifting from, you know, my teenage actor and adult actor in that like 17, 18 realm, it was probably between 16 and 20. I heard either I was too Hollywood or, and then by the other side, I was too Little House or Waltons. It was like, nobody could figure out where my niche was mm. in casting me. Um, but it like was one of those things of, it was mainly Little House. She's too Little House. It wasn't really the Waltons, but she's too Little House. So it almost ended up being this, I don't want to say curse because it wasn't a curse. I loved working, 
But from a casting standpoint, they had me branded as Two Little House because I had done Two Little House episodes. Hmm. Interesting. So, so then your sort of transition out of acting, what was that around that time then? So basically I was blacklisted. Um, I had stuck up for myself on set um, on something that I was a regular on. And um, because I stuck up for myself, um, I really, I actually got a letter and, um, I really couldn't get a role after that. Um, so it was again, painful because, you know, my whole childhood I had wanted, I always said, if you ask me what I wanted to be, I wanted to act, write, direct, and produce, um, my own shows. That was my whole goal as, um, a kid, teen, that's what I wanted to do. So then to be basically be able to told I wasn't going to work again, it was an identity crisis. Wow. So who am I going to be now? Um, I still hadn't worked through the abuse because really what had happened is, you know, I had kind of had um, in my high school years, I had didn't really deal with the childhood abuse, but I had found new purpose and then when I got this other show, my senior year of high school, I was on it for basically a year and stuck up for myself. Um, it re-engaged those messages of who I was. Mm -hmm. um, you see, you're only good for your sexual sexual purposes. You know, they were all lies, but they just re-engaged. Mm -hmm. And so not only did I lose my identity as far as um, who, who I was going to be as a professional, but it reintroduced those lies of who I was never intended to be. It was just a sexual being. And I had to rework, but it really became a time of, um, in all honesty, um, I became suicidal. Um, and I, there was a day because what had happened is I had put going to UCLA on hold. I'd been accepted. Um, I had to not go because I was going to be working every day. And then I got fired on the day in which I was supposed to start at UCLA. Um, and I had been told that you could take a quarter off at of UCLA. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna take this quarter off, get my head on straight because I had bought a condo in Westwood and now I had no income to pay for it. So I had to figure that out. And then when I went to go back and apply to, um, what's it called? register, register for classes. They're like, we don't have you in our system. And I found out you could take every quarter off except your first one. So oh, it was just this whole identity crisis. And then I bought into the lie of that. I didn't matter. And, um, I was driving alongside of, um, the street next to UCLA. And I'm like, if you go straight, um, it'll all be over. All this pain will be over. And then as clear as day, um, I believe that I heard God say, I gave you life. What right do you have to take it away? And I never contemplated suicide again. Um, it was just, okay, who am I? Um, and I started rebuilding. Mm -hmm. um, and the real work took place, um, you know, approximately five years later when I started dealing with the sexual abuse. I didn't understand how it had shaped my life and who I was. I thought I was perfectly normal. I was the only normal I knew, but it was time to create a new normal at that time. Um, and part of that journey was creating a new normal outside of Hollywood. But I, it's it's been a good process. Um, you know, it's, it's d difficult for most people who don't choose to walk away from acting. Um, where it's kind of chosen for them. You know, I mean, I know that you went through difficulties of, let's say, rebranding yourself. Um, at least that's what I recall. If after a show such as The Waltons, which is so, where you were an established character. For me, I had these established characters. And leaving, um, you know, traditional Hollywood, um, when it when you love it, is 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 a painful process. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I mean, I, I did, um, direct a lot of local theater out here for young people. Um, and I loved that. Um, I was 
the director of drama um, and dance at a church for 10 years. Um, so I, I love the arts. I love um, that performance and directing aspect. And I did do that for a handful of years afterwards. But I've talked to different friends and there's nothing like going on a set. There's nothing like it. You can't duplicate that high. Um, there's just a something special about being on a sound studio. Um, but there are other highs in life and you just mm -hmm. have to look for them and create um, new opportunities and new purposes and figure out where those um, aspects of childhood fit in. And, you know, I'm very fortunate to be able to use my speaking um, abilities to make a difference in people's lives who have been victims of crime and help reshape, um, hopefully, you know, long-term the judicial system as it affects people who have been victims of crime. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people have asked, oh, don't you get scared in front of this population or that, you know, police officers or heads of state? And I'm like, no, because I had such amazing exposure from the age of four into my early adult life that prepared me for that. And so I will be forever grateful for the opportunities I had growing up. If people would like to learn more about your organization and would, or would like to be able to help in some way, uh, why don't you tell them how they can, what it is and how they can locate you? Absolutely. Um, our website is aquarterblue.org, which represents a quarter of children will be left blue from the trauma of sexual assault. However, education is the key to prevention and early intervention is the key to restoration. So we've grown our organization to not only um, help with victims of sexual assault, but we help all victims of crime and their family members. And um, so you just go to a quarterblue.org. It, it is mapped out there in many ways. I also have a second nonprofit um, called Ryder Wade Foundation. It is in honor of my son who was killed two years ago. Ryder was in preparation to take over a quarter blue um, as a therapist. Um, he really had a passion to help um, make a difference. And so in honor of him, we have the Ryder Wade Foundation um, also, which helps um, with victims of crime and also athletic scholarships because he was a water polo um, athlete at Concordia University, Irvine, and he was leaving practice when he was hit and killed. So it provides scholarships for um, athletes at Concordia within the aquatics program. You, your life is amazing. And, you know, the things that you've had to face, you know, you've clearly had to rise above a lot of things. So really bravo to you for staying strong and for finding that path forward. And I think that's important as, um, you know, as a role model to, because people go through things in life, some things will be not as tragic as what you've experienced. Some will be equally so. And I think the important thing for anybody is to know that there are, there is help, that there are Absolutely. people out there who care and to, you know, maybe, maybe the first person you try to talk to doesn't listen, but there are people, there are those of us out there who care, you know, so the fact that you have taken this on as a cause to take what you've been through and empower others to not have that happen in their life or to help them find a way through it. Because I think like you, I mean, I believe there's always a way through, there's always an answer. There's always something we can do to take our life back. You know, someone said, how do you do it? I, I just tell me. And I, the way in which you worded it, I was like, pause for a minute. And I realized, you know, it was a choice. I had the choice of um, resentment or resilience and restoration. And when we were at church yesterday, there's a song called Oceans and, and it says, keep my eyes above I believe it's the wave. And it's like, if we can fix our gaze knowing there's a way out 
fix it above the waves that come crashing down, knowing that resilience and restoration are possible. But we have to get out of that funk of resentment and staying stuck. And and I, and it, I mean, it was challenged two years ago with writer's death of, mm. um, do I believe what I tell everyone? Um, you know, I have the tools and am I going to be a hypocrite to my work and what I tell everyone, or am I going to live it out again? And, um, but healing is an option for all of us. We don't need to stay stuck. Yeah. And that's, you know, often people will say, well, would you go back to acting? And my answer is if the opportunity opened up and I didn't have to use all my time to go to auditions <laughs> to take it away from my work, but I would take a job any day that, you know, fit who I am as a person just to bring greater exposure to my life's work. Because we know that with what people call celebrity brings credibility. And if I could have even a greater platform to share that resilience and restoration is possible and it's each person's gift to hold on to. Everyone is worthy of that type of healing and wholeness. Mm -hmm. I, I would in a heartbeat take a job to be able to have a greater platform. Well, I hope that this small platform that I have here will be of some of some help in spreading the word. You know, thank you for coming and sharing not just about our fun times on the Waltons, but about life. The one thing I realized actually when we were together last is as I was leaving, you know, because I guess, you know, as you could tell from our interview, I don't remember a whole heck of a lot from our shooting schedule and the episodes and all that. Um, but it hit me that Jeffrey and Serena were taken away by Aunt Rose almost in hiding to protect the two kids who are wounded by their biological dad. Mm -hmm. And the Waltons brought in these two kids who ruffled feathers and didn't fit into the mold of the calm of the Waltons. You know, everybody was growing up and were starting their new lives. And here are these two kids come who are smoking and stealing <laughs> just shaking the foundations of the house and they didn't create excuses for the kids. They gave them unconditional love and a place to learn a new normal. And that's part of who a quarter blue is and who I am is we love people even when they don't fit the norm. And yet we teach them how to create a new normal through love. And it's just, just mind boggling to me that that was my character on the Waltons hmm. and another way in which my life gave an example of how a quarter blue should love on people who've ex experienced trauma was how the writers on the Waltons developed the characters of Serena and Jeffrey from their past and what their future would be because of the love of a family. Mm -hmm. Well, love you, sweetie. <laughs> and I'm so glad you're a part of our family. Uh, and I thank you so much for coming to join me. Well, thanks for the opportunity. And sorry, I couldn't bring Keith with me. Another time just means, you know, it just means we have to do it again. <laughs> That's what I have for this segment. I want to thank Martha for coming and joining me. And I'll be back with more behind the scenes of the Waltons and more Ask Judy. Thanks for watching.